This is the Economic Review. Now, the offer supply in the commercial office space that was brought about by remote working arrangements will take at least 24 months to normalize as the economy goes back to a pre-COVID state. According to real estate firm Has Consult, the offer supply is mainly in Abubis, Kilimani and Upper Hill areas. Campbell County accounted for the land's share in inland price drops with six out of seven towns registering decreases in asking prices. Campbell Town witnessed the biggest annual drops of 11.4% followed by Riru at 6% and Limuru at 3%. Tigoni was the only town in Campbell County to register a 1.9% increase in land prices on the back of recent infrastructure upgrades and stringent land use laws in the area. This morning, therefore, to help us uh, paint a picture of these numbers this morning, we're joined by Effie Otieno, who's a real estate research assistant and uh, financial literacy coach, Wahome Gary. All right, just before we cross over to you, Effie, let's look at how the real estate sector has been performing um, for the entire of... Um, 2019 2020 let's look at what has been credit to the real estate sector so far in the country and that's exactly just before we cross over that's exactly what it is that we've been talking about this morning in terms of prices in the residential sector we have a 1.2 percent drop prices in apartments we have a 4.6 percent drop as well just before that let's look at what has been the um, the trend in terms of a uh, real estate credit in that area as well. We're waiting for that data. All right, Effie, let's start with that this morning as well. I mean, talk to us that this is going to correct in the 24 months to come. But how are we? Because the underperformance of real estate sector actually did start a long time ago, even before the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, well, we see the oversupply mainly has been in the uh, retail sector and yes. the commercial office yes. sector. Uh, but uh, this one started a while ago, before even the coronavirus pandemic um, uh, started. So this is not something new to the real estate market. We see the commercial office sector uh, currently has around 6.3 million square foot uh, oversupply. This is it's very high but um the coronavirus pandemic is just something that that has, has accelerated the oversupply so uh talking of the commercial office sector which is mainly uh the sector that has uh that is experiencing the current oversupply we expect this to continue not only in the next 24 months no 24 months is uh slightly uh, it's too small or too little over time to say that it, uh, the performance of the sector will flip over. We see this uh, going even more than 24 months because there are a lot of factors um, shaping the commercial, commercial office sector yes. besides the coronavirus yes. pandemic. We also have the uh, current emergence of the co-working spaces and also the um, uh, co-sharing spaces. This one is also likely to shape the commercial office sector. So. I don't think 24 months is uh, enough for the sector to flip over. We have a lot of, um, it will take a lot of time, not now, maybe in the future, maybe in the long run. Yes, Mohamed well, Gabriel, good morning. Let me bring you in on this as well. I mean, has consult is saying, well, they expect that 24 months is when we're going to see a correction of this oversupply in office space. Do you believe that it's going to take 24 months? I mean, everybody is saying that, well, this shift to working from home is going to be viewed as a permanent shift in the economy. Uh, thank you and good morning and thank you for having me here. Uh, 24 months is actually a very short period. Uh, if you just think about COVID-19 and the effect of COVID-19, uh, what has happened? Uh, many uh, corporates have obviously uh, minimized the amount of space that they occupy, office space. There's been a push for people to work from home. Uh, we should not forget there have actually been people who have relocated out of Nairobi because with technology you don't have to work in the physical space in Nairobi. And so um, 24 months is obviously a very short uh, period and we have quite a big oversupply and we do not only have oversupply. We have a lot of buildings under construction. And they will be completed and so that's going to be there for for a while 
Um, the other thing is we have a lot of infrastructure developments that are going to change dynamics. Yes. Uh, if you get the expressway working, it's easier for people to work from away uh, from the CBD or the city, and they can actually be very functional. So combined effect of all these things, we are going to see a scatter of people walking away. And so this oversupply is not going to be addressed in 24 uh, months. That's too short a period. Effie, let's understand why Chiambu County, why Chiambu County and, and, and the likes of Ruiru's are the ones that are leading in terms of asking price drops within this period. Uh, I may attribute that to the current ongoing pandemic. You see, um, Kiambu County, which is uh, Ruiru, Raka, uh, Thika, and the likes, um, yes. have been, uh, let's say, institutional hubs. And as a result, uh, we've seen a lot of real estate developers uh, being attracted to the areas. But, the, but with the ongoing pandemic, we see uh, like a shift. Uh, people are trying to exit some projects and probably giving out deposit, uh, sorry, discounts uh, for real estate projects. And this is why probably the land prices have gone down. But this, um, looking, at, looking at it and comparing it to our report, yes. uh, it's just yes. on a quarter on quarter basis. But in the long run, we've seen Kiambu County uh, being one of the most growing areas. And this is mainly attributed to the infrastructural growth. We see the Tika Road uh, serving the Kiambu Road, uh, sorry, the Kiambu County. And this is the main reason why the prices have been appreciating. So probably I may attribute it to just the pandemic, people trying to exit projects, and that's why land prices have depreciated currently. Yes. But would you like to say that land, uh, the segment just by land itself, is going to be among those ones that are going to sort of contribute to the turnaround of the sector come 2021 without even looking at the developments on them? Yes, because uh, we are seeing a lot of infrastructural growth for yes. Kiambu County, uh, like uh, the Nairobi Western Bypass. This, uh, you see, infrastructure is one of the things that attract people to um, buy land. So this alone will help the se sector recover. All right, Wahome, let's also weigh in on that. I mean, well, they're the ones with the biggest percentages. Um, in drops in asking prices in these areas as well, the, the land in these counties. Would you give us a reason as to why they are the leading? You like to think that people are moving away from these satellite areas, the likes of Kiambu and going deeper and deeper? Um, I think this, this is a temporary place. Uh, one, uh, the cash flow situation in the country, when, when I mean, the effect of COVID-19 uh, means there aren't that many people who had a lot of money. We have, a, a, I think, also the politics of the country. We are in uh, 2021. Uh, we have all this uh, heat around the BBI. Uh, 2022 is coming uh, around. And, and that, that has its own effect. But this is temporary in, uh, in this way. Uh, I think we have a lot of infrastructure developments that will change everything. We've we seen the extension of um, uh, Waiyaki Way, uh, all the way to Rironi, and then we're going to have a new development. So the road continues being dwarfed from Rironi onwards uh, to Maivahiu and uh, Naivasha. And the Western Bypass uh, is part of it. We've seen the Southern Bypass. Uh, we, we All these infrastructure developments, uh, projects like Tulisi, uh, we have uh, projects like Tattoo City, all these are going to have an effect. And long term, this there will be a correction, and the prices will go up again. Mm -hmm. Effie, Kileleshua and Kilimani are also represented in that report as one of the biggest in terms of drops in residential segment. So two questions would be, Effie, what is your assessment of Kileleshua and Kilimani in that drop? And why is this segment, specific segment, the residential segment, the one that is heavily affected despite it being the one that has been performing prior to this drop that we're talking about here? Okay, for Kileleshu and uh, Kilimani, we talk of them, okay, we classify them under the upper mid-end market. Yes. And with the current pandemic that is going, we see a lot of people, uh, we see a lot of shift from the upper mid-end market of the real estate sector to the lower mid-end market. 
or to our people are also looking for affordable home options. So this is mainly the reason why the prices in Upper, oh, sorry, Kilimani and Kilelesho have been reducing. Because um, you see, with the let's say the COVID-19 pandemic has affected people financially. So you won't need an expensive home yet you can get a cheaper option. That's why we see a lot of um, shift from, let's say, the upper mid-end areas to the lower mid-end areas. Yes. So Kiliman, yes. uh, so Kilimani and Kilelesha, we classify them under those areas. And that's why we see people moving to other sides. And then there's also the factor of uh, the affordable housing, which the government is highly pushing. So um, you see, like, uh, you can purchase a unit at an affordable price. So why stay in Kilimani or Kileleshwa, yet you can get a cheaper home in another place, and it's relatively good. Yeah, so that's that's my main argument with that. Wahome, well, let's close this conversation this morning on this as well. I mean, if has consult is painting quite a damning picture in the real estate sector in the country, and we do know how we viewed the lending in this area as well, which we like to say has been improving, but marginally, if you look at exactly what the trend has been in terms of the credit to the real estate sector in the country from the banks, how do they interpret this? I mean, do we expect for them to be bullish and say, well, let's go and lend to them, despite what is going on in the sector right now? Um, I, I think we, we are a developing nation, we are a growing nation. The financial services sector and including banks are very important component that are part of this. Um, banks are very innovative, very creative. They will actually look at areas where uh, people need money so that they can be able to grow. We talk about all this infrastructure development, which is going to attract new kind of settlements. So the banks will obviously find their space to be able to lend to that. Uh, we talked about the, the lower levels and the push for government and um, uh, affordable housing. I think there's a new dimension that has come, which is a bit silent. A lot of people have not been able to look at it. The fact that you can actually use your pension fund to be able to own a home, and that's going to affect because uh, maybe people who would have borrowed now will not borrow. They will actually be able to take their pension. But this is, the, this is not the high end. This is the affordable housing area. So there will be a couple of those uh, dynamics that will come in there, but I still see the banking sector will uh, be required to finance a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure and real estate developments that will continue to keep coming in. If people retreat away from the city, there are functions they will see required there. We will we are used to the, the say the shopping culture. We now love the shopping malls. So the shopping malls will keep going away from the city. And so we need money to develop those kind of infrastructure. We have a taste for good schools, so we'll still need good schools in all those places. Uh, we need healthcare, and we're going to see a lot of this requiring funding, and I'm sure the banks have their space. Effie, how do banks view uh, the real estate sector in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and how, what has been a sluggish performance of the sector from 2018 up to where we are right now in 2021? Uh, currently, real estate sector is considered as a very risky env uh, investment, mainly because uh, of what we are seeing happening, uh, probably the COVID-19 pandemic. So this has resulted to lenders, not only banks, but other lenders like the circles, are shying away from uh, giving credit. And this probably will be in the short term because we are yet to recover from the effects of the pandemic. So currently, the creditors are taking um, taking it back or lying low uh, uh, in their underwriting approach as a strategy, probably to cushion themselves against the pandemic. Um, but in the long run, we expect it to be better. So currently, banks consider real estate um, as a risky environment uh, investment. But in the future, I think I think things will get better. Effie, clear for us this conversation of real estate. What is your general outlook of the sector in, in this first quarter of 2021? Our outlook of the sector is neutral. Uh, however, we are negative for the commercial office sector based on the current oversupply. <clears throat> for the residential sector, we are also neutral because as much as we are seeing prices depreciating, it's not on all sectors. We have the affordable housing uh, initiative by the government cushioning the real estate sector.
especially in the residential markets. Uh, however, um, we see an oversupply in the higher end uh, market, which is affecting the real estate performance, mainly in the residential market. For the retail um, sector, we are also neutral. As much as the sector has been uh, underperforming, we also have some things that um, are cushioning the performance of the sector, like uh, Kenya being ranked number 56 uh, in the ease of doing business. We also have the positive demographics the uh, infrastructural developments that are um, cushioning the, real, uh, the residential sector. For land, we are positive. Land is, uh, is an asset that has always been um, resilient or appreciating all the time, given the, also the infrastructural projects <coughs> that we are current, currently seeing. We see land, sorry, <coughs> I have a um, small call. We see land, uh, appreciating higher and okay i've mentioned residential land commercial office commercial office we are still negative because of the oversupply um people working from home and also the growing popularity of the com uh, co-working office spaces for listed real estate sector which is also um an aspect of the real estate market we are uh, negative because of the decline in the share prices so overally, we are neutral because as much as we have some negative bits, we also have some positive bits and neutral bits. All of those, we can't say that it's all bad for the real estate sector. So we have a neutral outlook. Pretty much, Effie. Oh, thank you very much for joining us this morning for this discussion mm -hmm. on the real estate sector performance as we get out of what has been the worst uh, for economy 2020 under the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. All right. Meanwhile, a new survey by Stanbic Bank Kenya shows that economic conditions in the Kenyan private sector during the month of January were at their best level in three months, marking the seventh consecutive month of growth since the COVID-19 outbreak. According to Stanbic Purchasing Managers Index PMI survey, rising levels of uh, new work encouraged several business to hire additional staff. Now, the PMI posted 53.2 in January, up from 51.4 in December to the highest Reading for three months. Export sales also continue to rise, although the upturn slowed to the weakest for seven months. Farms highlighted that the reopening of the businesses and improved cash flow in the economy helped to generate higher customer spending. Good. Just before we look at that data, it therefore begs for us to look at what has been the unemployment levels in the country because they're saying, well, job openings are expanding let's go back to quarter three of 2020 because those are the numbers that we have and then we'll look at the unemployment levels okay let's shift to that data this morning and the long-term unemployment which we are going to define as people who have been without work for 52 weeks that's more than one year we're calling it the biggest there is under 20 to 24 uh what we have 103,714 as well now the rate of employment by age cohort we're calling it a strict definition and by that we mean people who are currently or have been without work for more than a full weeks and you can actually see that 20 to 24 again has the biggest percentage all the way to 60 to 64 as well sort of representing the general trend that we've seen all the way from quarter two again of 2020 again under that as well we do have um 20 to 24 again representing the biggest one and you can see that jump to 442 956 000, with 25 and 29 also representing that biggest cohort in terms of unemployment in the country fine wahome we're with you now Again, the thing that, well, private sector activity is now rebounding and we intend to see that. Do you agree with that assessment of the PMI report? And do we continue to, are we going to continue to, to see this grow in 2021? Uh, let's borrow from what has been in the past. We, I think we have an idea of what we call the Darwin theory. Yes. That uh, when there are changes, um, it is not the strongest who survive. It is not the fastest. It is the one who is capable of adapting. 
and what private sector has actually done because of COVID-19 is to look for ways to continue their business and get it more cost efficient. And I think this is where this index is coming from. If you look at what happened most of last year, um, COVID impacted the traditional way of doing businesses. And so a lot of uh, private sector firms have been looking for alternative solutions of how to continue. There's been big use of technology. If people have to work from home, we have to look for ways to do all the continuities. We've seen people changing um, the, their distribution model, um, their management model, um, their interaction with their clients. And, and I think now we've gotten to a point where now people have found the formula that is working, and that is where this growth is coming from. So if it is people in the service industry, if it's people in the production industry, just a good example is schools. If you think about schools, the private schools, because of COVID-19, a lot of them were able to go online with their, with their pupils. Now the schools have reopened, so there's actually more interaction. The facets of the school that was not working, the busting system, you know, the catering system and all those, now those are working. Just, just a small example to show you now what else has been activated. If the buses are working, we're using more fuel. No, we have to keep the drivers hired. If the kitchen is working, we have all those things that we have to buy to run the school. And I think that is where that uh, indication is coming from. That the systems the private sector has looked into is largely working now and they're able to do more consumption and able to do more uh, production. Under that, uh, this PMI report is also saying that we do expect that um, our economy is going to rebound to 5%. Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of numbers. Uh, Treasury is optimistic that it might jump to 6.2%. Other analysts are saying 49 on the optimistic end. Now, the PMI report is saying that 5% will be our number at this year, which also means that we have to peg that economic growth within the number of job hirings that we're going to see within the economy. Now, 2021 has started. We're still navigating the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, and we're still talking about how some companies now is when they're thinking of going back to more hirings just to go back to their, to their pre-COVID-19 state. Now we have the taxes back, pay is back, VAT is back, corporation tax is back. Do you think this is going to curtail the growth that the private sector could enjoy and get back to where we were pre-COVID? Uh, I think the numbers are a bit generous. Uh, we are hopeful, which is not a bad thing. It's good to be hopeful. Yes. It's also good to be realistic. It's good to be realistic. Uh, if you're looking at are we going to have more people taking up, uh, more employers hiring more people, I think my answer is that's not going to be a big possibility people are grappling with the people they had hired before. And because they don't want to lay them off, there's been a lot of reorientation, restructuring of how the jobs are being done. And you can look at any sector, whether we look at the media sector, whether we look at the transport sector, we look at the school system, uh, we do not see uh, employers taking up a lot of new employees. We are, most of them are concentrating in configuring the workforce they have. We don't want the people to go but we might find a way of keeping them productive. And so these numbers are a bit uh, generous. Yes, uh, the, ta the taxes are back. We've seen all the taxes are back. And they will have an effect. If your productivity is not as high as it was before, and the taxes are higher, that's going to have some, some, some sort of uh, pull down uh, that, that is going to slow things down. And that's why I say the numbers are a bit uh, generous. Um, at the national level, I think we don't have the actual focus to be able to move ahead. Um, the, the, the leadership of the country is not looking at the economic side of things. I think we are looking at the political side of things. And that always has an effect on the things that we're going to do. We have seen a curtailment of direct foreign investment because people are not certain what's going to happen. So if they wanted to come and invest, they are holding their money. Every time the money comes from outside into the country, that creates possibilities of new jobs and new establishments. And so we are not likely to see a lot of that in the next two years. And so that's why I say these numbers are a bit too generous. Yes. All right. Mohamed, look at that number that we're playing with. It's 5% that um, this PMI, Stambik PMI report, is actually trying to sort of forecast our growth to grow by this year. But what has changed, Mohamed? I mean, we're still operating under curfew. 
We're still observing the measures the government has put in place just to make sure that we don't become predisposed to infections within the economy as well. What has changed? Could, could, we, could we look at that and then say maybe it's too optimistic? There's something that has changed. We must, we must obviously able to see the mental shift. If you're looking what has changed, the mind. Just about a month from now, last year, we were all full of fear and dread and not knowing what to do next. Now, within the whole year, we have learned a lot of things. We have learned how to operate. Our mind has told us that this COVID situation is not getting away tomorrow. Yes. You know, initially when we closed, we thought it was a week or two. We've gone over one year. So people have learned to operate in this environment. And this is what adaptation is all about. We have learned to, the, the restaurants are back and open. You know, the eateries are back. Um, the, the transport is back because we have configured in our mind that this is a situation that's not going to go away. We've been told about the vaccines and we're hopeful they're coming. And I think here they're coming this month. But we told, even with the vaccines, we have to keep the measures. We have to continue keeping the mask social distance, we have to keep washing our hands. And if those measures are going to stay, people have learned how to live with them. And once you learn how to live with them, then you have to find out, how do I do my business within that environment? Yes, the curfews are still there, and maybe they have the purpose there, but people have learned how to do their work. I mean, you've seen the entertainers, the music groups, they found how to entertain us even without doing an overnight at the club. So this is what, what is, is a mind shift. And that mind shift has been very necessary, and it is informing the, this positivity that we have about the growth. Pretty much, Wahome, I bet we take a short break. Once we come back, we are looking, therefore, about what the Competition Authority of Kenya is doing just to promote this rebound that we're talking about this morning, if indeed the 5% economic growth is going to be a possibility. What are we talking about? We are talking about how they are relaxing competition of rules within the country once we come back. Welcome back to Metropole Television. You're still watching a Business AM's economic review where we're telling you the biggest headlines that you're waking up to this morning as you're closing your week. Now, the coronavirus pandemic has forced the Competition Authority of Kenya to relax rules around competition to allow companies to temporarily collaborate in mitigating the effects of the pandemic. Now, the CK said it will relax the rules under restrictive trade practices to spur recovery in certain critical economic sectors, which include manufacturing, private healthcare and research services, horticulture, aviation and tourism. Now the Competition Act, as it said, curtails restrictive trade practices such as sharing of strategic market information, joint distributorship and supply agreements including marketing or sales strategies and also research into new markets. CIK Director General Wangombe Kariuki, while providing details to the new framework, noted, and I quote, however, the authority, that is CIK, is cognizant of the fact that COVID-19 pandemic has impacted businesses negatively, reducing their capacity to penetrate and expand into the new markets and, to some extent, depriving them the capacity to adequately serve all the geographical markets in Kenya. And quote, Section 30, Part 2 of the Competition Act allows for exemptions from restrictive trade practices with the approval of Finance Cabinet Secretary. We're still with Mahome and Gary this morning. Mr. Mahome, how strong are the anti-competition laws in Kenya? Because now it's when we're getting it for the first time that, well, they are going to be relaxed. Um, I think uh, they, they are reasonable. Uh, they work. They may not be st stifling, but they, they, they work well, and um, that's why we've not had a lot of uh, conflict. So we cannot say they are excessive. I think we can say they are reasonable. Uh, but um, in times like this, we need to be able to function together so that we can grow um, the, the economy and the people can have a uh, quality life. We are heading towards Vision 2030, and we need to be a min middle-income country where people have a good standard of living. 
And so it is, it is obviously a good thing that we can be able to share what we have so that then with that integration, we can be able to do a bit more. Just outside um, the, 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 the CAK's authority, yes. let's take an example. Uh, just think about Kenya Power and KRA. Now, Kenya Power is able to supply everybody with electricity. So they actually literally know where everybody is. Now, KRA is looking for the same people so that they pay taxes. And Nairobi um, County government might be looking for the same people to pay their hand rates. What would happen if that information was in the same database I shared? You can actually be able to see everybody would actually be able to pay their taxes. Everybody will be able to pay their rates because we have all the data. But when it is disjointed, Kenya Power is able to sell you electricity, but Nairobi um, City Hall doesn't exactly know where you are. And KRA also doesn't know where you are. I'm just using that to illustrate how effective it can be if you're able to share those resources, because that would be very good in integrating um, uh, the, the, the economy. And I, I bet that's where Huduma number is coming from. Yes. Again, for government services, that's where it is coming from. But nothing stops us from taking it on to another level. But we must be obviously be cognizant of the need to secure people and their privacy and what they have. And I think that is what the Data Protection Act is aspiring to do. So that, yes, even if you, you have somebody's data, these are limited to what you can be able to do with it. Let's ask ourselves a question, Baha Mangare. How important is this move and is that what local businesses need now more than ever it's, a, it's an important move and i think yes local businesses need that more now than ever yes. like you said about um penetrating the markets there are people who have leverage they've been able to get to a market space but they are not providing all the services that are required so somebody else can be able to ride on that to be able to provide another service. What's going to happen on the overall for the consumer? I like talking about the consumer because a lot of times um, I'm, I'm a financial coach and I deal with the individual. The cost, of, the cost of delivery will go low. Now, the cost of the services will go low. We'll be able to consume at a lower cost. And that, that's, that's the way we, we can actually be able to see it. So that if, we, if all these people are able to share the information, they'll be able to reach me and they'll be able to reach me at a convenient cost. So I'll not have to pay a premium that is not necessary just because of inefficiency. Part of the, the reason why many things are expensive is the inefficiency that we have. If that inefficiency is taken out by this integration, then the, 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 the cost of supplying services and goods will be lower. The consumer will enjoy that. And when the consumer is able to enjoy that, they can be able to consume more. When we consume more, we create room for production. And that's how we grow the economy. So that's why it is very, very important. Yes. And let me, let me point you out to a specific aspect that they are actually alluding to in this relaxation of this uh, competition. Now, they're saying that the sectors that are going to consider are the ones that are critical during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, Mohamed, which sectors we consider critical in our country? And don't you think then, if we are also talking about helping the private sector and businesses therefore spar within this COVID-19 pandemic, that they should have extended this to every other sector within the economy? Uh, you only start somewhere. You can't start everywhere. Yes. So we start somewhere. It's okay. Now, who is critical in these uh, times? Just think about healthcare, the whole range of what we call healthcare. I think that's very critical. If we can have a system where we can reach people with the information, with the medicine, with whatever it is required at a reasonable cost, that's very, very critical for us. And and, and when you, if healthcare is that critical, just look at the, the communication, anybody who is in the communication sector, because that's how we're going to reach the people. That's how we're going to deliver the information. That's how we're going to deliver the goods. So you can actually just see those two. For example, that they are very, very uh, critical for these um, the, for the times we are now. The other one that's very critical is education, and sometimes we forget how critical education is. And we've seen a lot of statistics from our prisons, by the way, that a lot of people who are in prison somehow their schooling was always a challenge. They had what we call the frequency. They never got good education. If we want to stem this kind of problems in years to come. We must look for ways to deliver quality education. And that's why sometimes we got excited some back when we were told that there will be lab, um, tablets for every child. 
because that means would have gotten a lot of good information to every child everywhere they are in this country. So education is very key. When you have an informed uh, citizenry, you are able to move. In fact, they say if 25% of your population has post-secondary education, your growth and your development is going to be faster. And this is the model that was followed in Southeast Asia. This is what they did in Singapore. This is what they did in Indonesia. Just get a quarter of your position of a population having post-secondary training, that they have the knowledge and the skills at that level. And that's why education is that important. If you have a lot of people dropping out of school all the time, you are going to have those problems in the future. And let's, let's just look at where we are now. We've been told about all these teen pregnancies, and the numbers are very big. Now, what happens to those children who are born? What's the possibility that they will actually get the proper upbringing? And so what type of citizens are they going to become 30 years from now? And that's why education is very key. So I can single out healthcare, I can single out education, and I can single out telecommunication. And I don't forget agriculture. We have to eat. If yes. we have no food, all the others don't add up in any way. Yes. Finally, therefore, Mr. Wahomengari, should have they added a timeline on this? saying maybe for the next one or two years this will be relaxed because as it is now it's upon them to decide when they're going to stop it i would want to uh, hold the position that is being done in the best interest of the nation yes and a time frame time frames are very very important when you leave things open-ended they never happen so time frames are very very important yes they should have been a time frame so that then we have um by this time we open up this sector by this time we open up this sector it also helps the people you are working with to prepare because it is not just opening they have preparation they need to do on their end and that would have been very very helpful long term we, we see that as the way to grow this country we cannot be different compartments organizations that have learned like different compartments have come to an end we we have uh, many businesses that have businesses or government departments that are fallen in tough times because they were not able to adapt and change. And so this integration is very, very healthy and timelines would work very well to help everybody to prepare and make the best use of the relaxation that is there. Pretty much, Mr. Wahomengari, thank you very much for taking your time this morning to speak to us here at Metropole Television. We really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me here and I say all the best. Right. Well note we come to the end of our show this morning good morning